So our next speaker, he's here, there he is, <laughs> is Professor Daniel Hamer. Uh, he completed his undergraduate and master's degrees here at MIT in the life sciences. He then moved out west where he got his MD and PhD at Stanford and then back east again to complete his residency in internal medicine at the MGH and a hematology oncology fellowship at the Dana-Farber and at Brigham and Women's. He then came back to MIT again um, where he completed his postdoctoral training under David Hausman. After sampling virtually all the institutions in town, he joined the faculty at MGH where um, he's been ever since. He's currently the Kurt J. Isselbacher and Peter D. Schwartz Professor of Oncology at Harvard Medical School, a practicing physician at the Mass General and the director of the MGH Cancer Center. He's an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and a recipient of the AACR uh, Hinder Rosenfeld Award. His interests span molecular genetics underlying targeted cancer therapeutics, Wilms tumor suppressor genes, and most recently, and I think what he's gonna tell us about today, circulating tumor cells. He's the leader of one of the new AACR Stand Up to Cancer Dream Teams, um, in which the Koch Institute is participating, and he's a close colleague. Uh, the title of his talk today is Circulating Tumor Cells. Welcome, Daniel. Thanks very much, Sangeeta. It's a, it's a great honor to be back. As you've noticed, I was both an undergraduate and a postdoc at MIT, so I was trying to figure out last night at the dinner which of the various flashbacks is responsible for the PTSD, which I feel this morning. But other than that, it's been a wonderful experience, and it's great to be back. So the work that I'll talk about is a collaboration between our own group at MGH, uh, which has been in, bringing in both clinical and molecular insights to this project, along with the bioengineering group of Mehmet Toner, who is an HSC faculty member as well and leads the BioMEMS facility. And as this collaboration has evolved over the last few years, it's really become a model for us of collaborations between clinicians, molecular biologists, and engineers, sometimes or most of the time speaking the same language. So this is the challenge that I want to pose, and that is the question of metastasis. We don't know very much about metastasis. Most of what we know is from mouse models. And it, the, really, the, the ability to study that in human patients has really been dependent upon developing the technology to be able to assess these kinds of phenomena. So we understand that tumors metastasize to a great extent through the bloodstream, and that's how they spread from the first primary site to the brain, the lung, the liver, and sites which make it incurable and unresectable. How a tumor leaves the primary tumor and intravasates into the bloodstream is still a question. There is definitely evidence, in, particularly in mouse models, that this, these cells can become less epithelial, more mesenchymal, and more motile. And then at the other end, how they re-enter tissues and create metastases would seem to be an opposite type of phenomenon where they become less mesenchymal and, and epithelial again. But again, these phenomena have yet to be characterized fully in human patients. And then what happens in the middle is what we'll talk about today, which is what happens to these cells when they're circulating in the bloodstream. The assumption is that they're very rare. The best guesses are that they're about one tumor cell per billion normal blood cells in a patient with widely metastatic uh, cancer of any type of form. So these are very rare cells, but the true number, what they look like, what they do in the circulation, how long they're there, all of that is, very, uh, is unknown at this point. So there are many, many questions that you can ask uh, relating to circulating tumor cells, and I want to focus on three, and I'll give you progressively less data as we get to the more and more futuristic and hypothetical. So the first question, which I think is here today, and I'll show most of the data relating to that, is the application of CTCs in studying metastatic cancer, particularly in non-invasive sampling for genetic markers. What's happening in cancer, and I'll, I'll touch on that briefly, is really a revolution in targeted therapies, which means that for defined subsets of cancers, our treatments are getting more and more effective, which means that it's more and more important to understand what we're doing at what point to a particular patient. And the tumor evolves genetically. So it becomes very important to be able to sample tumors, preferably non-invasively, at particular time points during the course of therapy, much as a standard of care in infectious diseases, for example. So this, I think, is a very real application of CTCs right here and now. 
looking to the future, there's definitely the hope that as the technology evolves, we will be able to define circulating tumor cells and their roles in early vascular invasion. And if the technology can move to that point, then the idea of early detection of cancer may become very real. And I'll touch on that very briefly. And finally, the question of biological insights. Really, you can take out a cancer, you can irradiate it when it's localized. Wouldn't there be a nice approach to define which are the cancer cells that are responsible for metastasis, finding drug targets, and then being able to devise biomarkers for early metastasis so that the whole power of the drug industry could then be targeted towards preventing metastasis and measuring impact without having to wait multiple years to see if a patient actually will develop metastatic disease. That's much more hypothetical, but I, like, I, I put it here because that will be the true, the true ultimate benefit of CTCs will be if it enables us to both treat and prevent metastases. Now, there are many technologies for picking up metastases. This is from a review article from Klaus Pentel. And there are intravital approaches. There are approaches that use fast scanning uh, microscopy. There are other approaches that try to benefit from the fact that circulating tumor cells or epithelial cells are often somewhat larger than blood cells. So lots of different technologies out there. Almost all of them work with cancer cell lines, which are spiked into blood. Very few of them actually work in patients with cancer. And the reason for that seems to be that epitopes are expressed at very different levels in tumors from real patients compared to cell lines. Circulating tumor cells are very susceptible to degradation, apoptosis, and other real life phenomena that really cannot be easily recapitulated with cell lines. So there's really a technological challenge first to how to develop these approaches and then to test them in patients with cancer. The two that I've highlighted here, this is the commercial technology which has been developed by Johnson & Johnson uh, through the Veridex platform. It's an elegant approach which uses an antibody to EPCAM, a common epithelial marker. The antibodies are tagged with a magnetic nanoparticle, and then a magnetic field is applied such that the rare circulating tumor cells are driven in a magnetic field to be able to allow their isolation. This is a very powerful technology. It's now semi-automated. It suffers still from sensitivity issues. So in most patients with known metastatic disease, only half of them will have detectable CTCs. And on average, the median CTC is about one per mil of blood. So again, they are there, but the numbers are too low for many of the applications that you would like. The technology that I'll describe has actually evolved. This is our first generation chip, which was developed in Mehmet Toner's lab, and I'll touch on this. But the idea was to use microfluidic approaches to try to push up the sensitivity of this detection. Now, the idea of this technology, this is the first generation chip developed by Sunita Negrath, a postdoc in Mehmet's lab, was the idea of doing much less. So instead of batch purifications, taking a sample of blood, flowing it directly through a microfluidic chamber and trying to devise a system by which normal blood just flows right through and circulating tumor cells are captured. And they're captured on 78,000 microposts. These are a few microns, about 10 microns in diameter, and they're coated with the same antibody to EPCAM. Now, I, I hesitate to talk any engineering at MIT, so I'll summarize it with this one picture, which really identifies the fact that the chip was optimized to have the minimum amount of shear stress. So the calculated shear of two to four mils of blood going through this nanofluidic device is calculated to be less than, than blood going through the heart valves during normal circulation. At the same time, if you end up with streamlines of blood going through these and never really coming into collision with these, with these columns, then the capture rate will be lower. So every three rows, there's a staggering in the diameter uh, the distance between these posts to cause just enough turbulent flow to maximize collisions between these rare circulating tumor cells and the posts which are covered with antibody. There are a couple things you can do. You can image the cells on the post when they're captured with fluorescent dyes, or you can lyse the cells on the chip, isolate RNA or DNA, and then undertake genetic analyses. Now, this is what it looks like. This is the chip. This is a scanning EM showing you all the microposts. And this is um, there's actually a very nice box that makes it look very official. But if you look behind the box, this is what it looks like. This is the manifold that holds the chip. And this is the processor. Now, this was the first patient that we studied, a patient with lung cancer. You can see in false color on the scanning EM, the lung, cell, the lung cancer cell is in yellow, captured here. And the way that CTCs have been defined is that you capture them with antibody against EPCAM. 
Then you visualize them with a DAPI stain to make sure it has a nucleus. You come in with a secondary stain, in this case against cytokeratin in red, to make sure that it's an epithelial cell. You stain at the same time with an antibody against, in this case, CD45, to make sure that it's not a contaminating white blood cell, and then you merge the image. So one of the big challenges, of course, is the fact that you still have contaminating white cells in this mix, and you need to define that what you're identifying as a hit is actually a true cancer epithelial cell that looks like a cell and is not a blood cell. Now, in the first set of analyses, we, we, we studied a few, uh, a few dozen patients from the Mass General Clinics, look, including patients with lung, colon, pancreas, breast, and prostate cancer. And on average, the median count was about 50 CTCs per mil, so considerably higher than where the field had been. And once you're in that dynamic range, then you can start following patients over time. So this is a, uh, a particularly nice case in which we were able to follow a patient with lung cancer over about a year, and this patient was treated with chemotherapy. You can see in blue the CAT scan was performed at a number of intervals, monthly intervals, and you can see it showed a response after about two to three months of therapy. And in this case, you can see that the number of CTCs, 150 per mil, dropped relatively quickly with the response to chemotherapy and then mirrored the CT response that we could see. So again, it really implies that once you have the numbers, you can start to ask both numbers type questions as well as molecular questions in following cancer. Now, the challenge is that um, Sunita Negrat, the postdoc in Mehmet's lab who developed this, could actually make a small number of chips absolutely beautifully. But ramping this up to the type of levels that you need to uh, initiate clinical trials requires a whole scale-up effort, which was led by Ravi Kapoor. And there are a number of challenges. We were able to successfully ramp up silicon chip production, sample processing, and CTC imaging I'll talk about in a little more detail. But clearly, this is still a two to six hour per sample type of approach. And the biggest challenge turned out to be chemical functionalization uh, using all of these, um, these micro-post-type devices. And that was really the impetus for us to develop the second generation chip, which was developed uh, by Shannon Stott, again, a postdoc in Mehmet's lab. Now, you all know this, that if blood flows through a chamber, most of, this, most of the blood cells actually will not come into contact with the edge of the, of the container or of the chamber. And that was the incentive for putting these microposts within the chamber. The other approach is to actually play with the chamber itself. And this is what uh, is called a herringbone mixing channel, or we call it our next gen uh, microfluidic chip. But it basically contains a pattern um, on the top surface here, which creates these micro vortices. And the micro vortices, then, this is a technology initially developed by George Whitesides, really creates flow, which forces the cells into the bottom or the top surface of the chamber. Again, both of these are now coated with antibody. And the technology for doing this is much, much easier to scale up and more reproducible than the one th that's present in our first generation chip. So this is what it looks like. You'll notice that we can now do this in various types of PDMS or plastic surfaces. So it's now see-through. There are multiple chambers uh, to enhance the flow of the fluid. And you can do all kinds of imaging at a higher level now. This is the kind of pictures that we get. We're now looking at, in this case, uh, prostate cancer cells. You can see three cells here identified by nucleus staining. This is prostate-specific membrane antigen, a very nice antibody for prostate cancer. This is the leukocyte cells here with the red cell marker. And again, you can identify these with a level of resolution that we did not have before. And because the chip is transparent, you can now do standard pathology type stains, HNE or GIMSA stains, and look not only at these large uh, prostate cells here, for example, again, a large prostate cell next to a white cell here, but you can stain them with regular types of analyses that, and stains that pathologists are comfortable doing. <clears throat> 